dark gray dress as much as I could see of it which was approximately down to the knees and up to the shoulders there was no head there was what about the history of the house itself? The f now, I understand the first, was it the first two rooms of the house? Yes, were built the, long before the rest of the house. But what was the say, year for that? Would well, it? I'm not quite sure of that, John. We have to look into the records. Uh, but only because more people have lived in these homes, more chance of tragedies occurring in those homes. That's why we're called into uh, many of the houses along our seacoast, because they are very old. This is why you have so many hauntings occurring in places like France and England, uh, places where homes date back, you know, 800, 1,000 years even in some cases. So that tragedies do create the ghost syndrome. This home had a number of tragedies. And then to culminate all of these, a woman who practiced witchcraft, who had in her earlier years actually murdered her own child by driving a uh, stake um, or a nail through the head of the child as a gift, again, to Lucifer and black magic rituals. This woman lived all of her life in that home, had practiced uh, negative witchcraft, black witchcraft, and then at age 90-some years old, had made a pact with the devil to commit suicide, which is a great insult to the Creator, uh, to take the physical life away from someone. In this case, she had destroyed it on her own. And this, again, goes into black magic and a pact with the devil. The apparition-like figure that Mrs. Perrin had seen was this woman. Remember when she said she could see a black sack of some type, which hung very loosely to one side of the head? This was because, of course, when a person is hung, if you've ever seen someone like this, John, you will notice that the head goes to the side. And this is what was it was duplicating here, the hanging which had occurred to this woman and the pact that she had made with the devil. A pact made over a hundred years ago and being fulfilled in the 20th century. I'm John Larrabee. The time is 1973. And the persons living in this house are about to embark on a nightmarish journey into hell. How would you conduct an investigation when you, when you came into this home? Where do you begin? First, I would, of course, interview each and every individual who had experienced any type of paranormal or supernatural activity in the home. While I am doing this, John, Lorraine, who is my wife, is a light trance medium, a sensitive, would go through each room in that house trying to pick up through vibrations, negative or positive uh, vibrations, so that we would then leave the house, evaluate our findings, and decide what it is we can do to help the family, if indeed there was anything that we could do to help them. In this case, I do not believe that any exorcism, any ritual of a religious nature, or any one could ever clear that home of the very negative spirits which are involved in it. We have both human and inhuman spirits in this home, which are bringing about these destructive acts. At this point, John, I think that we should take our audience into the parent farmhouse. Let them hear for themselves the original interview between myself and Mrs. Perrin relating her terrifying experiences in this home for over two years. See now. Carol, today, November 1st, All Saints Day, 1973. Carol, you had called us up and told us that there were supernatural activity, what you would consider supernatural activity, taking place in your home here. This is my second interview with you, but would you again please relate from the beginning the different types of hauntings, the phenomena that had occurred to you in this home? We could probably start with the clock, with the banjo clock. Moved in. Uh, the hands on the banjo clock, which was neither wound nor set, kept moving themselves from 12 o'clock high till quarter past five. Mm -hmm. uh, every night, every morning we'd reset them till 12, and every night they'd move to quarter past five. Mm -hmm. um, 
Doors uh, began to open and shut mysteriously. These are these doors right here, these two doors? These dining room doors that, that lead into the small bedroom. Mm -hmm. uh, the piano would play mysteriously at night. It was uh, so disturbing that we began to tie doors shut, to put things against doors, just mm -hmm. so we could get a night's sleep. And even with this, you had seen string or cord break with the doors tied with the force with of them. the door forcing itself open. Uh -huh. Now, what about the fireplace? You had told me different things that occurred by the fireplace where you had fainted, uh, where you had the incident with the orange and so forth. Right. Uh, I like to take, we burn the fireplace constantly to conserve heat in the winter. And I like to cuddle near the hearthstone to get the heat. So I often bring a cup of coffee there in the morning or, or a piece of fruit in the evening to sit by the mm -hmm. fire. And I sat one, one evening with a uh, sun-kissed orange. My girls all took an orange and I took an orange. We all sat down and started to cut the orange open and blood started to drip out of the orange. Did it look like real blood? It looked like thick, rich, red blood. And it frightened the children. They started to scream because they thought I had cut myself mm -hmm. with a knife. And we watched it pour ooze out, at least an ounce of it, maybe two. And mm -hmm. then it just stopped. And now, did this shoot. drip onto the floor? It dripped onto my feet. Uh -huh. and coagulated on my feet, just as blood will when you cut yourself. Uh -huh. Now, what else happened by that fireplace, Carol? Uh, toward this, this spring, this coming spring, uh, uh, this past spring, rather, March, in that area, uh, I began to sit by the fireplace with my coffee, and each time I'd get up, I'd feel a, a strange weakness. And one day, I, I just stood up from the hearthstone and fainted. Mm -hmm and fell against the hearthstone. And then this began to happen uh, regularly when mm -hmm. I would sit there. So I, I began moving away from that area. And on one occasion, your feet actually went into the fireplace, didn't they? Well, my husband was here. Had he not been here, I could have been burned or I could have hit my, I, I hit my shoulder rather badly on the stone. Mm -hmm. Now you had also told us about the phones ringing and your incident in the closet. Could you tell me about this? Oh, yes. One evening, I had um, taken a bath. We have a, a, a room off the bathroom, which is a chimney room, where the center chimney was removed, which, which left like a closet space with a small chimney, furnace chimney running through it. So <clears throat> I went there to dress. It's always warm in that room. And uh, it, it also doubles as my clothes closet. Mm -hmm. A coat hanger came down from the, from the rack. Mm -hmm. I didn't bump it. I didn't touch it. I wasn't near it. I was bending over at the time. Came down off the rack and started pounding me on the head six or eight times, mm -hmm. uh, and then hit my shoulder and then dropped to the floor. Now, there was no logical cause for this that you could Absolutely find. Absolutely none. I wasn't anywhere near it, mm -hmm. and it was not logical for it to hit me several times. Logically, it should have hit me once and then fallen. Now, the phones, uh, you had said something about a party one night. Yes, we had uh, several people over, maybe. Okay, we left off where Ed and Lorraine left the Amityville house after their first visit. Then what happened? All right, now, did we go to the point where we came home here to our home and what had yeah. occurred in our home? Um, that happened before the seance? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, that was the first visit. Okay, so the first visit, visit you came, you drove from Long Island back to here. Right. Yes, but then what happened? All right. When we were driving back, I was more than aware that Ed was not himself. He was driving in a very erratic manner. Uh, I tried to talk to him. I told him I was very hungry. I could remember I'm that. I got over that. Huh? I got over that. Where I was driving, I thought I was on the wrong side of the road. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's not another, this on the, then it's a little facet. Yeah. Oh. Now we're doing a sequence right. towards the master. All right, um, we were driving home and I told you and I was very hungry because when uh, you communicate in a home like Amityville, when you're there for discernment purposes, uh, I will try sometimes not to eat in advance. But so when we were leaving, I told him I was very hungry. Ed was not talking to me. Not that he was angry, not that there was any animosity, because there was not. He just was not communicating. He was not acting rational to me or not acting. Ghosts, witches, demons, psychic phenomena, do you believe? Do you know? It's all too well known that New England has had its fair share of the unexplainable, stories and mysteries that, after hundreds of years, are as much a mystery today as they were then. What do you know about witches, demons, ghosts, poltergeist activity, even human vampirism? Mysterious phenomena that has plagued mankind since the beginning of time. This is John Larrabee. You and I are about to actually visit some of Connecticut's haunted areas tonight. We'll also bring out many facts about witches, ghosts, and demons. With the help of Ed and Lorraine Warren, Instructors at Southern Connecticut State College heading a course in paranormalology and demonology. They are also lecturers throughout the country on the subject and recognized as New England's leading ghost hunters. A great deal of trouble has been taken to ensure the authenticity of what you are about to hear. Many of the stories were actually recorded on the spot where they happened. Some hundreds of years ago and some more recent than one likes to imagine when it's late at night and you're all alone. Today there is a growing interest in the supernatural and a new breed of investigators. Ed and Lorraine Warren aren't just part of that movement, they're its pioneers. For the past 31 years they have studied, researched, and investigated paranormal activity worldwide. Studies and findings have been verified and documented with the assistance of psychiatrists, doctors, priests, mediums, and the full resources of modern paranormal research. What you are about to hear is not a story. It's a documented case taken from the Warren Files. A case of a tranquil farmhouse in Rhode Island that has been the scene of strange and unusual activity for over a hundred years all previous occupants of this house were plagued with misery and suffering, where violent deaths such as murder, suicide, and drowning were the norm for everyone who challenged the house. The interviews you will hear were not staged. They are the actual recordings made during the investigation into the events taking place in this house. Ladies and gentlemen, The Haunted, Chapter One. I turned over, and standing next to my bed was an apparition or an entity or something in an old, dark, gray dress, as much as I could see of it, which was approximately down to the knees and up to the shoulders. There was no head, 
What about the history of the house itself? The f now, I understand the first, was it the first two rooms of the house? Yes, were built the long before the rest of the house. But what was the say, year for that? Well, it? I'm not quite sure of that, John. We have to look into the records. Uh, but let me say this. Could you give me a general idea? Yeah, I would have to say the 1700s was when the house was first built. And, of course, uh, the tragedies that occurred in this home really was what had been the more or less the fountainhead for the hauntings which occurred later. We know that tragedies uh, create the ghost syndrome. And, uh, of course, this home, as uh, our audience will soon learn, had a number of tragedies which were very unnatural. Many people say to me, why is it usually that it's the older houses, you know, that seem to be haunted? Simply because more people have lived in these homes, more chance of tragedies occurring in those homes. That's why we're called into uh, many of the houses along our seacoast, because they are very old. This is why you have so many hauntings occurring in places like France and England, uh, places where homes date back, you know, 800, 1,000 years even in some cases. So that tragedies do create the ghost syndrome. This home had a number of tragedies. And then to culminate all of these, a woman who practiced witchcraft, who had in her earlier years actually murdered her own child by driving a uh, stake um, or a nail through the head of the child as a gift, again, to Lucifer and black magic rituals. This woman lived all of her life in that home had practiced uh, negative witchcraft, black witchcraft, and then at age 90-some years old, had made a pact with the devil to commit suicide, which is a great insult to the Creator, uh, to take the physical life away from someone. In this case, she had destroyed it on her own. And this, again, goes into black magic and a pact with the devil. The apparition-like figure that Mrs. Perrin had seen was this woman. Remember when she said she could see a black sack of some type which hung very loosely to one side of the head? This was because, of course, when a person is hung, if you've ever seen someone like this, John, you will notice that the head goes to the side. And this is what was it was duplicating here, the hanging which had occurred to this woman and the pact that she had made with the devil. Perhaps. A pact made over a hundred years ago and being fulfilled in the 20th century. I'm John Larrabee. The time is 1973. And the persons living in this house are about to embark on a nightmarish journey into hell. How would you conduct an investigation when you, when you came into this home? Where do you begin? First, I would, of course, interview each and every individual who had experienced any type of paranormal or supernatural activity in the home. While I am doing this, John, Lorraine, who is my wife, is a light trance medium, a sensitive, would go through each room in that house, trying to pick up through vibrations, negative or positive uh, vibrations, so that we would then leave the house, evaluate our findings, and decide what it is we can do to help the family if indeed there was anything that we could do to help them. In this case, I do not believe that any exorcism, any ritual of a religious nature, or any one could ever clear that home of the very negative spirits which are involved in it. We have both human and inhuman spirits in this home which are bringing about these destructive acts. At this point, John, I think that we should take our audience into the parent farmhouse. Let them hear for themselves the original interview between myself and Mrs. Perrin relating her terrifying experiences in this home for over two years. See now, Carol, today is November 1st, All Saints Day, 1973. Carol, you had called us up and told us that there were supernatural activity what you would consider supernatural activity taking place in your home here. This is my second interview with you, but would you again please relate from the beginning the different types of hauntings, the phenomena that had occurred to you in this home? We could probably start with the clock 
with the banjo clock. Moved in. Uh, the hands on the banjo clock, which was neither wound or set, kept moving themselves from 12 o'clock high till quarter past five. Mm -hmm. uh, every night, every morning we'd reset them till 12, and every night they'd move to quarter past five. Mm -hmm. um, doors uh, began to open and shut mysteriously. These are these doors right here, these two doors? These dining room doors that, that lead into the small bedroom. Mm -hmm. uh, the piano would play mysteriously at night. It was uh, so disturbing that we began to tie doors shut, to put things against doors just mm -hmm. so we could get a night's sleep. And even with this, you had seen string or cord break with the doors tied with The force with of them. the door forcing itself open. Uh -huh. Now, what about the fireplace? You had told me different things that occurred by the fireplace, where you had fainted, uh, where you had the incident with the orange and so forth. Right. Uh, I like to take, we burn the fireplace constantly to conserve heat in the winter. And I like to cuddle near the hearthstone to get the heat. So I often bring a cup of coffee there in the morning or, or a piece of fruit in the evening to sit by the fire. Mm -hmm. And I sat one, one evening with a uh, sun-kissed orange. My girls all took an orange and I took an orange. We all sat down and started to cut the orange open and blood started to drip out of the orange. Did it look like real blood? It Carol? looked like thick, rich, red blood. And it frightened the children. They started to scream because they thought I had cut myself mm -hmm. with a knife. And we watched it pour ooze out, at least an ounce of it maybe two, and mm -hmm. then it just stopped. And now, did this you. drip onto the floor? It dripped onto my feet uh -huh. and coagulated on my feet, just as blood will when you cut yourself. Uh -huh. Now, what else happened by that fireplace, Carol? Uh, toward this, this spring, this coming spring, uh, uh, this past spring, rather, March, in that area, uh, I began to sit by the fireplace with my coffee, and each time I'd get up, I'd feel a, a strange weakness. And one day, I, I just stood up from the hearthstone and fainted, mm -hmm. and fell against the hearthstone. And then this began to happen uh, regularly when mm -hmm. I would sit there, so I, I began moving away from that area. And on one occasion, your feet actually went into the fireplace, didn't they? Well, my husband was here. Had he not been here, I could have been burned, or I could have hit my, I, I hit my shoulder rather badly on the stone. Mm -hmm. Now, you had also told us about the phones ringing and your incident in the closet. Could you tell me about this? Oh, yes. One evening, I had um, taken a bath. We have a, a, a room off the bathroom, which is a chimney room where the center chimney was removed, which, which left like a closet space with a small chimney, furnace chimney running through it. So <clears throat> I went there to dress. It's always warm in that room. And uh, it, it also doubles as my clothes closet. Mm -hmm. A coat hanger came down from the, from the rack. Mm -hmm. I didn't bump it. I didn't touch it. I wasn't near it. I was bending over at the time. Came down off the rack and started pounding me on the head six or eight times, mm -hmm. uh, and then hit my shoulder and then dropped to the floor. Now, there was no logical cause for this that you could Absolutely find. Absolutely none. I wasn't anywhere near it. Mm -hmm. And it was not logical for it to hit me several times. Logically, it should have hit me once and then fallen. Now, the phones, uh, you had said something about a party one night. Yes, we had uh, several people over, maybe 12 people. We were all in the parlor. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, bells began to ring. The only logical thing we could associate it with was with the sound of a phone bell. Mm -hmm. So we uh, each went to a different phone and answered the phone, and, the, and it continued to ring. Mm -hmm. Even after you picked up the receiver? Even after we picked up the receiver. And when you hung up the phone again, it still it, continued it to still ring? It still continued to ring. So. Uh -huh. And now there were very terrible uh, incidents where an apparition had appeared to you by your bed. Could you tell <coughs> me about this, Carol? Well... I had been into the, in the city late one evening. My mother-in-law had been in a serious accident. My husband and I went down to help her straighten out uh, those affairs. We got in about 3 in the morning. I went to bed. I went into a dead sleep for t about two hours. Somewhere around 5 o'clock in the morning, I woke up so cold that I thought I was freezing to death. I was just cold unto death. I ran my hand this down was my an arm. Unnatural cold. Unnatural cold, and, and 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 even with the grogginess of sleep, I realized immediately that it was an unnatural cold. Mm -hmm. 
because the heat was on, the, there was the remnants of a fire in the fireplace, there was no reason, no logical mm -hmm. reason for me to be so cold. And uh, I touched myself, I felt like marble. Very, very cold. Right, I cuddled up next to my husband to try to get his body heat, and I simply couldn't get warm. It, it's, the colder I felt, the more I roused out of the sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, I turned over, and standing next to my bed, was an apparition or an entity or something in an old dark gray dress as much as I could see of it which was approximately down to the knees and up to the shoulders there was no head there was a black sack of some sort a, a, a woven effect hanging off to one side of the shoulder and it had on a belt the dress had a belt that's why I knew it was a woman the dress had very distinct tailoring to it and um would this resemble for instance you said that the head hung to the side would it be something uh that would resemble a person that had been hung it very possibly could the head was definitely not where it should have been mm -hmm. which would be um uh, between the two shoulders in the middle what happened then Charles? <clears throat> well i was very frightened uh I snuck back down and I pushed myself down under the covers and left only my eyes exposed because I was, it was very frightening. She had preempted uh, the area where my bureau was and was standing sort of in my bureau. It was no longer there. And uh, a voice, a kind of reverberating voice began to come out of the walls. First very, very uh, low uh, kind of droning chant, she was saying, get out get out get out and and it would bounce off of each wall and all of the walls at the same time until it just became the room became a mass of sound mm -hmm. <clears throat> now when this happened I said well I have something that my husband can see and I, I began to attempt to wake him up I shook him and I kicked him and I rolled him over I even at one point sat up in the bed and took his face in my hand and pried his eyes open and he, he just, just continued to sleep like he was dead and I was so frightened at that point I gave up on him and went back mm -hmm. under the covers and at this point the entity moved around toward the foot of my bed and began to do this chant at the same time her arms were shaking in rhythm up this uh, up above her there was no hand on the arm just a black line mm -hmm. where her arm would have been and she said I can only remember the first line of what she said and she said uh, there were like four stanzas mm -hmm. this thing. I'll drive you out with fiery brooms, I'll drive you mad with death and gloom. This would be sort of a witchcraft, uh, witchcraft chant, wouldn't it, Carol? It seemed to be some sort of an established... It was not something she was making up as she no. went along because it rhymed. Now, when did this entity disappear? Uh, she moved around toward the uh, foot of my bed and, and back over to the side of my bed where she was standing. As she did so, the chanting became louder and louder until it became a, a, a screech, until mm -hmm. the whole room was just, until it almost deafened me. I had to put my hands over my ears. Mm -hmm. I slid back down under the covers and, and up into my eyes, just my eyes. She leaned over the bed and then it was all over. Now, the what sound about went, the she went. You told me about? Oh yes, she had a horrible, horrible odor to her and it lingered for a long time, maybe half an hour, an hour after she had disappeared. What did this odor smell like, Carol? Well, it's hard to articulate. There's nothing I can compare it to because I've never smelled anything like it before. The only thing I could say is uh, moldy, dead, rotten meat. Mm -hmm. uh, what other things had occurred here, Carol, also to you? I know that you had the experience with the door downstairs mm -hmm. where it would just be nailed shut with that large plank and this would come off. Uh, was it your husband that nailed it? It was uh, several large planks were, yes. were pushed against it and the wiring wiring was uh, all entangled with this and it was tied shut it was even latched shut from the inside and I woke one morning to find the whole thing had just burst forth as though some something large mm -hmm. had come through with a great deal of force all the planks were scattered uh, askew and, and mm -hmm. the wiring was all ripped out now you also had other experiences in your home here that were frightening to you for instance the death of the children's pet rabbit which you i guess still do not know what had happened here could you tell me something about that well we woke one morning 
My husband left uh, early, and his friend, I had the overnight guest, to go hunting, uh, to go fishing, rather, excuse me. And they left about 4.30. At about 8.30, the women folk got up. We came into the kitchen. We made coffee. For some reason, somebody looked out the back kitchen door, and the baby bunny was laying on the lawn. It had been split open from under its throat right down. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't find any reason for this, could a you? A perfect incision, as though it had been done almost with a razor blade. Mm -hmm. uh, the cage had been lifted up and moved over. The bunny had been deliberately taken out of the cage. Mm -hmm. At first we thought it was wild dogs, but there was no reason. A wild dog couldn't have lifted the cage. Yes. Now, something else had occurred to your husband since we were here last. And uh, he had an experience in bed where he had found three scratch marks or claw marks oh, that were yeah. bleeding. Well, she, after the incident in the garden, after I fell, Oh, yes. And after I passed out in the said. garden, I was out working in the garden uh, and picking tomatoes in amongst the tomato stakes. And I had a fainting spell, a weak spell. I knew I was going to go down. So rather than fall forwards or backwards, I just kind of sunk to the ground to, to hurt myself less. I went down on a tomato steak. And it that was the last, yes, it impaled. It penetrated you? <laughs> it impaled itself in my thigh. To two weeks to get it These, out. These uh, fainting spells that you had, you had told me that you went to a doctor about them and they could find no cause for this. No, I had brain waves done, I had EKG, uh, complete blood workup. And since you moved into this house two years ago, you have steadily lost weight also. Right. I went from 130 pounds down to 108. And they can't attribute this to any physical cause? No. Uh-huh. All right, would you continue please, Carol? Uh, well, it, it seems that after the apparition appeared to me, I was no longer troubled by anything. With Your the husband exception, was then troubled? Right. Uh, she seemed to turn her attention to my husband. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one incident shortly after that. I had moved out of the bedroom, was sleeping in the parlor on the couch with a light on because of the fear of her. Uh, she did come to the side of the couch one night. The smell was there. I was wide awake reading poetry. Uh, I knew she was in the room because the odor, there was, I mean, odor. It, it's so, you can compare it to nothing else. And it's such a distinct odor that I knew immediately she was mm -hmm. in the room. And I tried to be very cool, continued reading my poetry. I was laying on my tummy and I felt something very sharp penetrate my the calf of my leg, which was kind of hanging over the couch. And I reached down fast and rubbed it and I came away with a drop of blood. It was as though she had pierced me with a pen. Mm -hmm. But she faded immediately after that. I had I was saying in my head in the name of Jesus Christ go away from me back where you came from mm -hmm. and I guess that drove her away or yes, something. Yes, this will. In fact, when the sun came up that other mm -hmm. occasion was when she disappeared. Right, the sun was it was uh, like quarter past five, and as soon as the sun seemed to break the hill back there, mm -hmm. she was gone. Just disappeared. Now, what had happened to your husband? On this particular? Well, uh, we were getting ready for going back to school. I mm -hmm. had taken all the girls one evening to buy them shoes for school and he was alone in the house sitting at the kitchen table eating steamers mm -hmm. and he heard her come up the stairs the cellar stairs and unlatch the door and it's the first time anything had been almost directed at him mm -hmm. by this entity and he was a little bit shaken by it so mm -hmm. he said to her out loud come out here and talk to me or go to hell back where you came from he was getting tougher. <laughs> right. And was this the same night that he had and the And he said the door, he heard the door click as though she had decided to go back down cellar. Mm. Now, was this the very same night, Carol, where he had the experience where he couldn't get up? You had heard him groaning and you didn't go into the bedroom and he had found the three big marks on his arm? Yes. I had uh, gone for the evening, retired to the couch with the light on, nice and safe. Yes. And he continued to sleep in my bedroom. Uh, sometime during the night, I woke up and I could hear him kind of heaving and, and rolling the same way I had been doing the night she appeared to me, almost some kind of a spastic thing that mm -hmm. I don't know if it was fear or what it was causing, but my body was lurching and jumping at it, and apparently the same thing was happening to him because I could hear the bed. And uh, he was moaning, he was whispering, mm -hmm. and uh, I said to myself, well, she's in there. But I was too frightened to go in to, mm. to attempt to uh, disturb what was happening in there. Mm -hmm. I just stayed on the couch, and, and this went on for like uh, a good 15 minutes mm -hmm. until it was all over. Well, the following morning, 
uh, I went in to talk to him about it, and he had three rather deep scratches, claw marks on mm -hmm. his elbow, and there was a good deal of blood on mm -hmm. the sheet. And he said that he uh, something had disturbed him during the night. He didn't know what, what had happened to him, but something had happened. Mm -hmm. This house has a, a very tragic history, too. You were telling me about it, Carol. Could we go over this uh, again? Yes. As far as I've been able to trace, which is only back to 1849, with, my, with the oldest deeds in my possession, the house was bought by a family of Arnold's from Salem and Maria Jefferson of Massachusetts. Now, I, don't, I haven't been able to find where they're buried. I don't, haven't been able to dig up any history on these mm -hmm. people. But the Arnolds <laughs> certainly had a great deal of tra tragedy, it seems, with every generation after them that lived here. Uh, there was Mrs. John Arnold, who uh, at 96, I believe, hung herself in the barn. Mm -hmm. um, Johnny Arnold was the son of John, of the same family, uh, went into the crawl space upstairs and drank horse liniment and committed suicide. There was Harmony Arnold, who was accidentally killed in the house somehow. I haven't been able to find a death certificate mm -hmm. on her, so I don't know how. And there was Prudence Arnold, which was of this family. She was one of the young daughters, uh, was, uh, was murdered not in this house, but at the next farm over on, mm -hmm. on Collins Taft Road. Um, she had her throat cut. How did this come about? Uh, apparently she was uh, asked to come over and uh, do some housework while the family went off to church mm -hmm. and, uh, on a Sunday morning, and she was murdered by, enticed upstairs and murdered by the caretaker. Mm -hmm. My throat was cut by a stra with a straight razor. Mm. Um, then there were cases where People who had lived here had frozen to death? Yes, there were um, two, two people who... There was Mr. Edwin Arnold, who went into the village and uh, lost his way on the way home in the evening and died in a snowbank in a swamp and wasn't found until several months later. Uh -huh. This was, was on the old road down here? What was the name of it? Uh, Sherman Farm Road. Sherman Farm Road. He knew a shortcut to get back to the house and he lost his way in the swamp. Now, there was a fellow who came down from the Douglas Way, up this way, mm -hmm. on the way to Harrisville, and crawled into an old shed that was... Uh, at was that the blacksmith shop? Right. It, it was a, at one time a blacksmith shop. It's mm -hmm. now torn down. The foundation is there on the edge of the road. Right. He crawled up in there, and he froze to death. And what about the pond in back mm -hmm. of your home here? There were a couple of... Yes, there were... Uh, part of this estate was once owned by some people named Baker, and... Uh, it, their estate was kind of absorbed into this one, and the house, the old foundation, still exists down there. And the two ba two of the bakers drowned in the pond. Um, mm -hmm. Now, first the father drowned. Was that correct? Right, and then the son. And do you know the age of the son when he drowned? Uh, the father was, I believe, in his sixties, and the son, many years later, drowned in his forties. That's a rather weird-looking pond back there. We took a ride down there. Uh, in fact, this whole area here seems sort of on the weird side. Beautiful in one way and yet weird in another. As we drove up here today, uh, we noticed that there were many old farmhouses. Some of them seemed deserted. But uh, anyhow, get on with your story, Carol. Is there anything else that you could tell us about? Well, uh, there was the evening that my husband and I were watching TV. Oh yes, and the loud sound. And uh, I, again, in front of the fireplace, with my head on the floor, uh, cuddled on the floor, with mm -hmm. my head on a pillow, and we had a dog then, uh, who had a way of uh, kind of cuddling up behind my husband's chair mm -hmm. and spending the evening with us. Um, the quiet, the TV, V was turned down nice and quiet because the children were sleeping. It was a quiet evening. And suddenly about midnight or 12.30, thereabouts, this very loud trumpeting sound went off out of the cellar. It was so loud that the floors vibrated in the house. My head was on the floor, and so mm -hmm. I, could, I really picked up on the vibrations. Even the walls shook, and some of my bottles, my antique bottles, rattled mm -hmm. a little bit. And the dog jumped up, of course, very alert and started looking around. My husband yes. leaned, looked, jumped up and started looking around. And then we all just sat back down because 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's happened before, these things. Now, this friend of yours, you, you had a couple who have stayed here, have taken care of the children for you. You have five daughters. Now, the man one night had tied a cord across one of the doors here and had watched it and had seen this cord break. Could you tell me about that? Yes, we have a pantry which leads off the parlor, which was at one time uh, in the old days the parlor pantry where all the fine china and whatnot was kept. And uh, I used it at, at, at the beginning to store my old books and bottles. And it's a very cold room. It's always extremely cold in that room. And we can never keep the door shut. Now, a lot of, of this type of thing in an old house can be attributed to uneven floors and the sway of the house and all of that. So we said, all right, we'll solve this problem. We'll keep this door shut by tying it shut because it would open during the night and it would unlatch and swing open mm -hmm. and, and it was cold. All the, the coldness would permeate the room. <coughs> so we tried tying it shut. I didn't think of that. We went away to Upper State New York and my friend and his wife stayed and they tied it shut and they sat all night long to watch this door rip itself open. Mm -hmm. And they would immediately tie it back. An hour or so later it would rip itself open again. Mm -hmm. There was just no way that they could keep this door shut. What about footsteps and other sounds in the house? Would you ever hear something like this? Oh, we, you told me about your husband's incident. Right. We hear many such things. It's so They're almost so common that we don't you know, re really make any note of it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you had also told me that wild dogs or some wild animals had uh, torn your pigs apart out here? Yes. As far as you know. I had, we had two little pigs uh, about four months old and we woke up one morning the neighbor's little boy came dashing in the house and the little pigs were called Romeo and Juliet. He says, Romeo is missing and Juliet's in the pig pen. She's all torn apart. So we went out and sure enough uh, the little female was all torn to ribbons in the pig pen and the other one we searched her all around and we found her down in the woods mm -hmm. down near the brook. Now you say that dogs might have done this. Are well, for sure lack of a better explanation, we assumed that dogs did it. Mm -hmm. We had uh, the dog catcher up, and he looked the pigs over, and he said that uh, we were to be allowed to kill any strays that we saw. Mm -hmm. Have you around. seen any strays around here? Yes, we did. We killed several of them. Really? Oh. Um, okay, Carol. Mm -hmm. I guess that's about all we went over the last time, wasn't it? I think, well, there are always, there are so many things that happen that, that mm -hmm. I might tend to forget a few yes. of them, but... I think that pretty well covers it. Uh, did I tell you about the metal plaque that I found in, in digging under the woodshed? No. Uh, digging under the woodshed one day for bottles, not too long after we moved here, because that's the first thing I wanted to get out yes. were the old bottles. I'm a collector. And um, I found a metal piece about three inches in diameter, which was apparently torn from a coffin. Mm. Uh, it had the name Sumner Walling on it and the date of birth and the date of death mm. and um, I was curious because as far as I know there were no Wallings uh, affiliated with Do you with still have this metal plaque? Uh, it very mysteriously disappeared. I had it in, in the spooky pantry, the one that the door won't mm -hmm. shut. I had it up on the third shelf and when I went back to find it, it was missing. Um, <clears throat> oh, you almost had uh, a fire here too, didn't you? Carol? Yes, I did. When we were away in New York, uh, just last week, as a matter of fact. Uh, I don't know how it happened, but the heat of the fireplace had permeated two sections of stone. The same fireplace that, oh, where the psychic light, light rider came down. You forgot to tell yes, me about I this. Yes, I forgot about that. Uh, this has been witnessed by a lot of people really? also who have visited here. It's only happened twice, but uh, fortunately both times there were people visiting mm -hmm. outside of uh, the family who saw this. Uh, a beam of light comes down the cellar, uh, excuse me, down the chimney. Of that fireplace. Right. It's, I would say, no thicker than a pencil. Mm -hmm not very much thicker than a pencil. It all happens within the bat of an eyelash, really. Mm -hmm. It happens so quickly that you you just stand there stunned. You don't, don't mm -hmm. realize what's happening. Down the chimney, snuffs out the fire, shoots across the room, re withdraws itself, 
and goes back up the chimney and then the fire comes back. Comes right back up again? Right. Mm -hmm. it, um, twice it's happened. And it's ha it has passed right through the children that have been standing there. Yes, there were children sitting on the floor and it penetrated <coughs> right through them and back up again. Uh-huh. Now what were we, we were talking about just before that? Oh, the fire in the oh, house here. Uh, the same fire. The hot ashes apparently, and we still can't figure out how, penetrated two thicknesses of stone mm -hmm. like this. One layer going one way and one and then that much sand mm. and, and ignited the beams underneath mm -hmm. the fireplace. And apparently it had been uh, steaming there for a long time yeah. before it finally caught. It happened while we were away in New York. Uh, one of my daughters smelled smoke. And uh, Have the children had any bad experiences? Mm -hmm. I know that you had told me about one that had seen something in her bedroom. When she My daughter decided that she was going to open up her fireplace upstairs, which unfortunately uh, turned out not to be a fireplace, but just a continuation of the chimney here. And But as she did so, she seemed to, un, uh, to disturb somebody, to upset somebody, unleash some forces or something, because she woke that night, she said, with uh, what looked like a thick uh, smoke or a mist rolling across her floor. Mm -hmm. uh, being a child, she didn't wake up enough to investigate this. She probably attributed it to a dream. Wasn't too interested in investigating it either, mm -hmm. I guess. Probably not. <laughs> Felt much safer under the right. covers. The children say that uh, things happen upstairs, and I believe them, because. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't seem to be upset by them. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to be disturbed. If there is anything that's happening to them up there, it's not the same kind of hostile force mm -hmm. that's happening down here. Mm. It seems to be mostly projected mm -hmm. towards you, though, uh, doesn't it? Yeah, it? It has been for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Well, all right. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, I can't think of anything else. Well, I have another thing that happened. Well, just before we left for New York, I mm -hmm. still have carrots and beets in the garden, and I want to wanted to go out and pull them up and finish off the garden and have it plowed under. Mm -hmm. I was picking, uh, pulling carrots out there, and it was a windy day, like today. <clears throat> but this house, uh, being very old, is still very airtight. How old is the house? The best that we can calculate, uh, one or two rooms that the house was built, according to the study of the architecture, was built in 1860. Uh, excuse me, um, 1680. 1680. And then was there expanded upon. Mm to add other rooms and other fireplaces and whatnot. How many rooms in this house altogether? Fourteen. Fourteen rooms. And um, getting back to the garden thing, mm -hmm. uh, something was going on upstairs. There was, I was in the garden looking up toward the back of the house. It was a bright, beautiful, sunshiny day. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a strange, spooky day at all. And uh, I heard uh, crying. Uh, kind of mingling with the wind. At first mm -hmm. I said, oh, it's wind, and it's working its way through the, the eaves upstairs, mm -hmm. or something is happening. But then as I started to, to listen um, more sharply, I could hear uh, a child crying. Mm -hmm. And it began to say, oh, uh, mama, mm -hmm. mama. And I said, oh, I'm not even going to listen to this. <laughs> I turned around and came back in the house. Mm -hmm. Because I'd never heard a child yes. before. Mm -hmm was very strange. And the chant that this woman <clears throat> would repeat over and over again was what? I'll drag you out with fiery brooms. I'll drive you mad with death and gloom. Mm -hmm. and she was very insistent that I leave the premises. I and the last thing she said before she, the final screech was, I'll drag you out. I'll, you'll get out, but it'll be, I'll get you out, but it'll be too late for you because you'll be dead. Said, I'll drive you out. With fiery brooms, I'll drive you mad with death and gloom. 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 This is John Arnold, suicide by hanging. Johnny Arnold, drank horse liniment, committed suicide. Harmony Arnold, murdered, spike driven into her head by her own mother. Prudence Arnold, murdered, her throat was slit. Mr. Edwin Arnold, Lost his way home, was found frozen to death near the house. Persons whose identity was never determined, found frozen to death in a shed at the rear of the house. Mr. Baker, drowned in a pond on the estate. Mr. Baker's son, 
drowned in the same pond, but 10 years later. Why would a door burst open? Can't a, a ghost pass through a wall or a door? Again, these actions are meant to frighten. Just as the orange was meant to frighten, as the uh, apparition-like figure, uh, headless, was meant to frighten this woman, so the door is bursting open, which is not a natural act, of course, John. We don't usually see doors bursting open in our home that have been closed. Or... These doors were not only closed, they were bolted, they were tied, and one had uh, planks nailed across it, didn't it? Yes, it had a heavy plank nailed across the door. Uh, they were wired shut with chicken wire, and yet they burst open. Again, through psychokinesis, which means uh, the act was done through mind over matter. A uh, weights of over 850 pounds have been filmed in homes like this moving across rooms, John. So to burst open such a door uh, would not be an act which was impossible where the paranormal is concerned. What was the uh, significance of the banjo clock and a quarter past five? Well, usually between three and six in the morning would be when most of your negative hauntings occur. The number three is considered a magical number, especially where witchcraft and satanic worship is concerned. So remember when the clock would stop at quarter after five. This is when your hauntings would also take place. Uh, Mrs. Paranet said she came home late one night. Uh, she had gone to bed. Suddenly she felt something in the room, and it was at the same time that the clock stopped. So these are all indications of what we call infestation, which means the stopping of clocks, the movement of furniture, the sounds that occur, and all of them, of course, again, John, are meant to frighten. What happened with the orange, actually? Well, where the blood had actually come out of the orange... We call this an app port, an app port through teleportation. This means that the substance of the orange uh, had been more or less contaminated, uh, contaminated with human blood. Uh, I have been involved, John, in many cases where we have found blood on pillowcases of where tragedies had occurred in bedrooms and so forth. And this comes through teleportation where the molecular structure of the substance or the items broken down, dematerialized, teleported to another area, and it is then seen and viewed in that area. That is to say that was real blood then? Oh yes, it was real blood. Where did that blood come from? This blood could have come from a um, number of places, John. It could have been taken from just any individual, again through Apport, the structure of the blood being broken down much as it is in lycanthropy where you have vampirism. Uh, the demonic spirit which inhabits the vampire, the physical body of a person who would be known as a vampire, does not actually bite into the neck of a human being and suck the blood out. It uses uh, the qualities of magic in regards to teleportation. Again, where the substance is broken down and materialized at another point. This is what happens with the blood in the case of the parent family. The mother is cutting the orange. Suddenly, blood flows from the orange. This was meant to frighten, just as most disturbances in haunted houses are, because as the mother would become frightened, seeing this blood come from the orange, dripping down onto the floor, onto her foot, she would throw off psychic energy into the atmosphere, which this negative force would then use to manifest itself in other ways. They intend to frighten the appearance of a woman in the bedroom in the dead of night. Doors bursting open that had been bolted, tied, wired, and boarded shut. Blood oozing from an orange. The mistress of the house fainting and being dragged mysteriously into the fireplace. Fainting in the garden and being impaled on a tomato steak. Being beaten in a closet by an unseen, unknown force. Unknown voices being heard day and night. Loud crashing sounds both day and night. Sounds that couldn't be explained away by anything relating to structural causes in the house itself. A person being mysteriously stricken with claw marks across the body when nothing was visibly there that could have caused it. A piano would play in the middle of the night with no one near it. And a clock that was neither wound nor set making mysterious movements. 
This is just a part of the occurrences in this house. These people finally gave in to whatever forces were possessing this house. They had to leave and ultimately did. Although this case was pursued in depth, it was determined that nothing could be done. Today the house stands, just as it has for 275 years, with the promise of hell to anyone who dares to challenge it.